Welcome to Yonder Lies. I'm Hannah Haberman. A little bit ago, we spent some time comparing and contrasting two different iterations of the cowboy in the American West in our episode, The Myth of the Cowboy. We asked how these two separate realities converge and diverge, and also how the mythologized cowboy informs the culture of Jackson, Wyoming, and the broader American West at large. Today, we're adding on to that conversation and coming at the symbol of the cowboy from a more musical perspective. And no one is perhaps better situated to speak to, live in, and create in the intersection of cowboy mythology, black identity, and American folk music, quite like American songster Dom Flemons. Without a doubt, Dom Flemons is a force to be reckoned with in American music. Born in Phoenix, Arizona, and of African-American and Mexican heritage, Dom's repertoire of music spans a century of American tunes and ballads, and he's performed with all sorts of American folk greats. Mike Seeger, Boo Banks, Taj Mahal, Old Crow Medicine Show, Guy Davis, and even Bob Dylan. Fleming's most recent album, Black Cowboys, was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Folk Album in 2019, and was also nominated for a 2019 Blues Music Award in the Acoustic Album category. It was an honor to have Fleming's here on the podcast. His passion for and understanding of the history and living potential of American music is infectious and enlightening. Not only that, but his work plays an important role in challenging and reimagining a whitewashed narrative around American music and the American cowboy. Clemens is a strong advocate for diversifying cowboy culture, a powerful storyteller, and above all, a compelling and visionary artist. Here's Dom Flemons. My name is Dom Flemons. I'm known as the American Songster. And a songster is a musician who sings and plays a lot of different types of music. And that's what I do in all of my shows. And I present that within the context of a broader historical narrative as well. Because as I've gone along, I guess as I've moved along as a professional nowadays, found that many of the songs that I've celebrated for so many years are now coming into their 100th anniversary. So I've made a point to mention that a lot of the songs that I present that are folk songs or blues or what have you are now celebrating 100 years of American popular music. And so in that way, I found uh, myself uh, reinvigorated to try to spread the stories of this old time music, whatever it might be, and how it connects to us in the current times right now. And I play a variety of instruments, uh, guitar, banjo, harmonica, the rhythm bones, which are kind of like a little piece of uh, animal bone that I, that I held together and they clack together like castanets. And then another instrument called the quills, which are like a pan pipe. And there's an American version of the pan pipes that I specialize in. So I do quite a few different things. I'm a record collector. I produce records, uh, record records, and, you know, just do a little bit of everything, trying to just spread the word about our wonderful American culture and try to, I guess, give some insight as America continues to evolve and move forward in the 21st century. Flemons has been leaving his mark on the music scene for quite a few years and his approach to music making and folk storytelling reflects both the traditional and the contemporary, honoring both the integrity of original tunes while also adding in his own style and voice. While performing in the Arizona music scene in the early 2000s, Flemons met Sule Greg Wilson, a Flagstaff percussionist, banjo player, and all-around folklore legend. Wilson became a mentor to Flemons in both technique as well as in understanding the history of blues in American folk music. This mentorship and musical relationship grew into Sankofa Strings, an ensemble featuring Flemons, Wilson, and Rhiannon Giddens on banjo and fiddle. Sankofa Strings explored a wide range of music, country and classical blues, early jazz and contemporary hits, string band numbers, African and Caribbean songs, and spoken word pieces. Over time, Sankofa Strings grew into the Carolina Chocolate Drops, a string band group featuring Giddens, Flemons, Justin Robinson, and Sule Greg Wilson on occasion. Much of the Chocolate Drops repertoire, which is based on the traditional music of the Piedmont region of North and South Carolina, was passed down to them from old-time African-American fiddle legend Joe Thompson. The group took the Southern folk music scene by storm. As John Jeremiah Sullivan wrote about the band in a 2019 New Yorker profile of Giddens, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, quote, shook things up by being black, of course, but more important, by reminding people that the music itself was black as black as it had ever been white anyway, and by owning it accordingly." End quote. The influence of the Chocolate Drops was felt far and wide. They performed at the ultra-popular Tennessee Music Festival, Bonnaroo, 
opened for Bob Dylan, contributed a song to the Hunger Games soundtrack, and played on a Prairie Home Companion, Fresh Air, BBC, and at the Grand Ole Opry several times. Members were added to the group as they grew in their scope and sound, and in 2013, Flemons left the group to pursue his own solo projects. In 2014, the group largely stopped playing together as more members explored solo work and other projects. In particular, Rhiannon Giddens has continued to defy stereotypes and artistically innovate in the folk, bluegrass, and jazz worlds. In the last five years, she's released three albums and also received a MacArthur Genius Fellow Award in 2017. If you've never listened to her music, I definitely recommend you check it out. Which is all to say that Sankofa Strings, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and the various members' solo projects have all worked to revitalize and reamplify a deep tradition of African-American folk music which has been consistently appropriated and written over by white folk music and white American culture. Here's Flemons on the history of African American folk music in the U.S. and what unique new opportunities exist for this tradition in the 21st century. For African American music, we have to go back to uh, several hundred years ago, you know, and and of course, African American music is linked within the history of slavery. So you have to imagine that there were enslaved Africans that were brought over from different parts of Africa. They mentioned West Africa a lot of times, but there are different parts of Africa that are part of that old colonial system. And through Africa and the Caribbean, you have a a workforce of people that finally make their way into the Southern United States. And through the communities that they would build, sometimes in segregated communities, and based on the decade, you might find them in their own all black communities that were also not necessarily segregated, but they were their own communities that were built uh, whenever the legislation was proper for them to build so. And so you have these folk cultures that grow from all these different communities based on the history. And so there's a repertoire of, of instruments like the banjo is an instrument that's said to be derived from African instruments from West Africa. And over a hundred years, you see this instrument develop from a Afro-Caribbean instrument into an Americanized instrument, which then becomes a part of the popular music of the United States through a a theatrical form called the Blackface Minstrel Show, which was a show that um, was a political satire show that showed Southern culture and Northern culture and Black and white culture in these very interesting sort of ways. And of course, the Anybody can look up the Blackface Minster Show and see there were many grotesque images that were placed within that. And so over time, though, you start to have these African-American performers that begin to have opportunities in the legitimate field, as well as in the field of folk music, as respected songsters and pioneers of uh, their community's musical culture. And these two styles of music just intertwine within each other again and again. And so when we get to the 21st century, we've seen, you know, African-American culture venture away from folk culture. And it also has its own popular music, which is R&B, which is funk and soul and go-go and hip hop and, and trap music and all of these different things. And I think for the first time, we're finding a lot of African-American people are starting to look into the deeper history of the past. And while before there may have been a visceral history, like for example, my, my grandfather grew up on the farm. So there's a visceral history to him growing up on the farm that he didn't necessarily want to look back on. But for younger people who have never experienced it, there is a moment where you want to go back and find out about the elders in your family tree. And I think that there's a moment in the 21st century we've gotten to that point. The conversation is beginning now, but I've, I have done everything I can to facilitate getting the resources in people's hands so that they can do um, what they will and interpret the history as they please. So for my end, what I've tried to do is I've tried to at least, I tried to advocate for the old time sounds and styles, because for me, there is a lot of cultural memory and a lot of cultural wealth and cultural value in some of the old time styles of playing and some of the songs as well. This desire to look back, to more fully dive into the past, to better understand the present, has felt like a central theme for many people, communities, and broader cultural conversations in 2020. The practice of trying to contextualize the present and the past and to imagine new futures informed by this understanding feels a lot like what's been going on for the U.S. this year in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and so, so many other Black Americans. As the country continues to reckon with racial oppression, police-sanctioned violence, and racial inequality. 
For Flemens, this idea of using the past to inform the present and carrying that understanding into the future is integral to every part of his creative process. Well, I do this with all of my work in some form or another, because there's a, a term I learned many years ago from a mentor of mine, Sule Greg Wilson, and the term was Sankofa. And Sankofa is a West African term that's roughly translated into English as go back and fetch it. Go to the past, grab those things from the past you need, leaving behind the ones you don't need, and bring them into the present and that'll lead you into the future. And it's depicted by a little bird that's flying forward and touching its beak to its back wing, representing sort of a regenerative birth of new ideas through the, you know, the very, the valid ideas that we want to retain and keep with us as we move forward into the future. Being from Phoenix, Arizona, originally, the history of African American culture in the Southwest is one that's known a little bit, but there were a couple of things I grew up with that I found were unique to the stories I read as I was going to college. Because, of course, I went to college, Northern Arizona University, and I studied English, and I studied ancient literature, and I studied many of the early essential texts that they teach within the curriculum. And it wasn't until I realized that there was a space in which I could help expand the scholarship through the music I would produce uh, through my recordings and through my advocacy that I decided to become a professional musician. Because before that, I was just learning songs. And then once I started to learn more about the African-American banjo, and I started to learn more about the string band tradition, and saw that it connected with the songsters who I had been studying already, people like Lead Belly and Papa Charlie Jackson, and people like Lightning Hopkins and Mance Lipscomb, I found that there was a connection to the string band music. So I went out to North Carolina, and I saw that I could be a professional doing historically based music that would inform people as well as entertain people I think with the same degree of potency if I was able to arrange the songs correctly, which I was able to do. And, and in, the, in the context of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, I, I took the idea of string band music and I brought jug band music, fife and drum music, early jazz, ragtime, and I added that within the context of uh, North Carolina fiddle and banjo music. And then we had something that was unique. It was both traditionally based, but it was also something that was progressive in its own way. And I have to think of people like Mike Seeger, who's a, a wonderful mentor to me as well, who taught me a lot about playing all the different instruments and being a multi-instrumentalist and a scholar and a musician all at one time. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Think WY, Wyoming Humanities. Wyoming Humanities supports programs, grants, and initiatives in Teton County and across Wyoming that explore history, culture, and the human experience. To learn more about the Wyoming Humanities Council, visit thinkwy.org. Again, that's thinkwy.org. Support for Yonder Lies comes from Wildlife Expeditions of Teton Science Schools. For over 20 years, Wildlife Expeditions has been leading educational wildlife tours in Jackson Hole, Grand Teton, and Yellowstone National Parks. To see wildlife and support education, visit wildlifeexpeditions.org. While still part of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, Flemons released two solo albums, Dance Tunes, Ballads, and Blues, and American Songster. Then, in 2014, Flemons released an album titled Prospect Hill, full of collaborations with other artists and spanning the range of folk, jazz, blues, ragtime, and country. Then came Flemons' 2018 album Black Cowboys, a project which, at its most broad, aims to depict the story of the African-American cowboys who helped shape the American West through song and storytelling. The album feels a bit like a collage, bringing together original songs written by Flemons, as well as instantly recognizable tunes like Home on the Range. The songs span across time, space, and genre, encompassing three main themes. The country music of the Wild West time period, the story of African Americans' role in that musical tradition, and of course, Black Cowboys as a broader cultural phenomenon. Here's Flemons on the process of finding, writing, and bringing together all the different and diverse stories and perspectives that make up the album Black Cowboys. Well, part of the inspiration for Black Cowboys came from me visiting my family back in Arizona one year. And uh, over the past several years, I've, I've gotten into the habit of going back to Phoenix and traveling down I-40, uh, down Old Route 66 to get back home. And one year I stopped off toward the Painted Desert, which is on the border of New Mexico, and I found a book called The Negro Cowboys by a, an author, Philip Durham, I believe it was the name, and Everett Jones. 
And this book was published in the mid-1960s. And these two gentlemen basically compiled all the information they could find on African-American cowboys because they found that even though there was not a lot of information on the foreground, you know, about black cowboys, it's not something, it's, it wasn't something that you couldn't find information about, but it was never on the foreground. It was always something that was sort of in the, the background of the story of Western culture. These two gentlemen put it together and they found, uh, they found all this, this beautiful information that goes back into ancient times to, um, uh, Estefanico, who was a, an African who traveled with the Spanish conquistadores in the, in the uh, I believe it was in the 1600s. But moving forward into the more, uh, I guess, the United States version of uh, Western culture, it, you start finding this history that goes between slavery and the end of slavery the, and into the emancipation era and it leads all the way into the era of, of 1900 when you start to have strict segregation coming into play uh, in the United States culture and I found that that juxtaposition was something that uh, one informs the way that we look at cowboy culture and then two like I mentioned before it proved to be a wonderful opportunity to be able to present stories about a I guess a traditionally marginalized history, but present them in a way that is not blaming anybody for what they did and did not do, but really glorifying and, and emphasizing and elevating the stories of triumph that are within the story of black cowboys. Because that was one thing that was very distinctive with each story about Nat Love or Bass Reeves or Bill Pickett or any of them was that all of their contemporaries said they were the best they ever knew. And that was something that really drew me in in addition to finding inspiration in these narrative stories of black cowboys, Flemings also found inspiration in an album released in 1999, titled Black Texicans, Balladeers and Songsters of the Texas Frontier. This compilation featured field recordings of songs from black cowboys, field workers, and inmates from Texas penitentiaries in the early 1930s, work songs, reels, ballads, and blues. The recordings were made by John Lomax, a white Southern musicologist and folklorist who, along with his son, Alan, traveled across the South with a 315-pound phonograph disc recorder, state-of-the-art at the time. These recordings, along with those made by others in spanning 33 different states, eventually became the Archive of American Folk Songs of the Library of Congress. And while there are definitely some white anthropology vibes at play here, it's pretty likely that this music wouldn't have been passed along, at least as widely, without these recordings. Here's Flemons on his experience of listening to Black Texicans. John Lomax's son, Alan Lomax, writes in the liner notes that the album presented is the only audio representation that we have of the very widespread Black cowboy singing tradition that his, his father and he grew up hearing and was in, uh, was in danger of disappearing when they started to record in the mid-1930s. And so the tracks on the record were meant to show a little bit of that idea of black cowboys. And when I first started to hear these field recordings, when I heard a guy like Moses Clear Rock Platt sing the song, he sang it with a different inflection that to me made all of the difference when it came to black cowboys and white cowboys singing. Not so much that there was a value I would place on it, but there was a subtle difference in the way he sang it, the way he put the song together and the way he put it they put the verses together in certain places. It reminded me of ways of like how you would think of soul music or how you would think of uh, early hip hop or trap music in terms of it being small repetitive phrases instead of it being long narrative phrases like you would think in the Euro Anglo-American ballad tradition, which is more along the lines of what John Lomax was documenting when he was making his first book, Cowboy Songs and Frontier Ballads. And then when it came to the music, I wanted to bring together the idea of the black songsters uh, that are part of blues tradition, but are not necessarily uh, placed within the umbrella of black cowboy culture. I also wanted to bring a couple of field hollers into the narrative, which is why I brought in uh, Black Woman. There were a couple of songs that have black cowboys uh, associated with the stories, like Home on the Range and Goodbye Old Paint, and I wanted to bring those together. There were a couple that I wanted to do that were just sort of audio snippets that kind of gave you an impression of a part of history, because I knew I couldn't cover it all. You can't really describe these things in words, but you can only try to make audio impressions so that your audience walks away feeling good about it. As Flemings just said, it is awfully difficult to describe these sorts of things in words. 
So in just a moment, we've got an original track off of Black Cowboys called The Steel Pony Blues. Flemons was inspired to write the song by the story of black cowboys who became Pullman porters, working on railroad lines to serve passengers on sleeper cars. Flemons was drawn to this story because of the influence Pullman porters had on the modern African-American experience. Until the 1960s, Pullman porters were exclusively black, and these jobs are often pointed to as an instrumental part in contributing to the formation of the black middle class. Additionally, Pullman porters formed the first all-black labor union in 1925. This was a landmark formation which helped contribute to the momentum that propelled the civil rights movement. Here's Steel Pony Blues. You get down to Holbrook, you won't find me there. Good Lord, I got the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Got the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Well, I caught my steel pony and boys, I'm going to ride. Getting far too old to follow this here herd. Good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Now I caught my steel pony and boys, I'm going to ride. I done told that guitar down, good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Now when you get over there, you won't find me. Cause I call my steel pony and boys, I'm going to ride. For Flemons, the process of creating Black Cowboys was not just full of historical revelations, but personal ones as well. While learning about Nat Love, a famous African-American cowboy who served as inspiration for Steel Pony Blues, Flemons learned more about his own father and grandfather. Nat Love was great because he had written his own autobiography, but when I read it, I was just blown away by the eloquence of this Black Cowboy story, and that it told a story of going from being in slavery to emancipation to then working as a cowboy and then he after about 20 years he retires from being a cowboy and becomes a pullman porter and then he ends out the story by saying he wants to create a retirement fund for old porters in a little ranch that he wants to make and of course he didn't get a chance to do that but in the course of a lifetime this fellow went from a, a horse and buggy to uh, he didn't get the planes but he got to trains and automobiles 
And I was so blown away by that story. That's why I ended up writing a few of them. I wrote uh, Steel Pony Blues, talking about Nat Love, and then a little bit of my own family story, because my father was, a, was an apprentice Pullman porter, which I did not know before this project. And he told me about the train lines and how that was an essential part of his growing up in Flagstaff. And then also my grandfather was a preacher and a sawmill worker, and the sawmill is, is very connected to the Western story. Uh, because it's a uh, it's the laborers that made the railroad. It's John Henry, and that's why I have a John Henry y los vaqueros. It implies African American workers on the railroad and the connection between the Mexican vaqueros and those railroad workers. And then I also wrote a a number on Bass Reeves, who was the first African American U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi, and he was said to have possibly been the basis for the fictional character, the Lone Ranger. All of a sudden, when I started to put these singular ideas together, I found it, it made an intriguing album. So as of course, as a musician, I started to write it out. I had the project and, and then I, of course, you know, cowboy music's tough because it's not really straight country music. And so I wasn't sure where to place the album or where to pitch it. Where to pitch a black cowboy traditional contemporary musical collage album is indeed a tricky question. Flemons ended up reaching out to Smithsonian Folkways, Smithsonian Institution's record label. Not only did they say yes, they also included the album as part of the African American Legacy Series, a collaboration between Folkways and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. The series explores the rich African American musical and oral heritage in the U.S. and includes compilation from the Folkways catalog, as well as previously unreleased archival material and new recordings of contemporary artists. For Flemons, inclusion in this series was a huge honor. Having it being a part of the museum was again a, a thrill because the African American Legacy series is, to me, is one of the tops when it comes to beautiful albums representing different aspects of African American culture. And it's still a living entity. So I really wanted to bring that contemporary aspect in. And so Dwandalyn Reese and Lonnie Bunch and all the great folks over there at the museum, they helped elevate this idea past being just a small idea, but it turned it into this really beautiful historical document for African-American Western culture. And of course, having done all this, I had no idea that 2019 was gonna be the big year of black cowboys when it came to popular culture. So I was also just so pleased that outside of my own work, I was able to create a framework within that context to be able to help others uh, be able to interpret their own history. because. Uh, I found that there are more African-Americans out West than people give credit for. And I was so glad to see so many Western stories begin to get told. 2019 was indeed the year of the Black Cowboy, with Lil Nas X and Old Town Road setting the record for the longest leading number one single on the Billboard Hot 100, greater visibility of urban cowboys, and an overall surge in reclamation of the historical Black Cowboy and cowgirl aesthetic by Black communities, fashion, and the music industry at large. For Flemons, one of the most challenging parts of making the album was trying to represent everything that such an expansive idea like Black Cowboys could encompass. The hardest thing with a concept like Black Cowboys is it's, it is never ending. And there are two Wests. There's the real West that you can go to. You can go to the West now in a car or a plane or anything. But then there's the imagined West. There's the legendary West. And that's something that every American can relate to. So I also wanted to make sure that I had both of those Wests represented within the a sepia-toned context for the, uh, the Hollywood West and an African-American context for the historical West. Yeah, because I, I didn't grow up in, in ranch culture myself as an African-American person, but I have a claim to being someone who was born and raised in the West, in the, in the cities of the West. And so that was something I had to look into myself was how do I translate if I'm not a cowboy by trade, how do I translate my experience as a Westerner to this concept? And it, it then turned into a give and take of Black Western culture. So then it expanded even past cowboys. Flemons hopes that Black Cowboys, both in its physical presence and all the concepts it holds, will help expand representation of African-American Western culture within the music world and in Western schools, museums, and gift shops. That's why, in addition to an hour of music, the record itself also comes with a 40-page booklet with extensive notes and photographs, providing a history of the West from an African-American perspective. There are thousands of books about the West in general, but one of the things that with Black Cowboys I wanted to do is I wanted to have a single piece of 
ephemera, almost a souvenir product that would be great in a Western museum. Because I, I travel to a lot of museums when I'm on the road. And one of the things I found in Western museums is that they might have one aspect of African-American Western culture within their gift shop. Like they might have just the Buffalo soldiers, just the Negro cowboys, just something on black cowboys of Texas or the West, some version of that. And I wanted to make a singular item that could cover all of those things in some, in some regard. Because of course, at first I wanted to write every song and just do a full originals album. But it dawned on me that this product, if it sat in the Western museums 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 100 years from now, that is something that people can pick up. And in those 40 pages, they can read a basic history of the West from an African-American perspective. They can know there's a museum that exists that will confirm this. And then also they can hear some wonderful music. That, that, was, that was a righteous deed to me. I just, I just knew that that had to be done. Not every project uh, is, comes along so easily in terms of the intention, but I feel like that's the strongest thing that can be done now is just having more representation, whether it's in the exhibits, especially in the curriculum, because the kids got to be able to read this. The adults have to be able to read it, take it in for the history as it is, and then be able to really immerse themselves, digest it, process it, whatever you got to do, and then be able to move to the next step. Above all, Flemons hopes that people will connect with the music and that this connection can, in some way, move people. At the end of the day, the best thing about music is music is for entertaining and for people to really fall in love with the music. And just like, um, you know, just like a, I don't know, just like a little honey with, a, with some lemon, you know, it's a, music can be the sweetness that helps out those sour moments in life and those sour conversations. It can help. It can't do everything, but I, I feel that there is just so much power that can be told through beautiful music that people can fall in love with. I, I found instead of it being traditional and contemporary, I found compelling. If music is compelling to me, that's what really draws me in. And I try to make compelling music for others. And I, I'm so glad that so far I've been able to do it a, a few different times, but uh, hopefully there's just more along the way. So I'm, I'm going to keep on at it as long as I can. Here's one more from Flemons to close out the show, a tune originally sung by early Alabama folk singer Vera Hall. Here's Black Woman off of Black Cowboys. Thanks for listening to Yonder Lies. Come here, Black Woman. Uh huh. And sit on Daddy's knee. Uh-huh. Well, I've got something to tell you, pretty mama. Uh-huh. Don't you holler, Lordy. Uh-huh. Well, I'm going out to Texas. Uh-huh. To hear that. Wild ox moan. Uh -huh. And if it's morning, don't suit me, black woman. Uh -huh. I'm gonna drive my bell cow home. Uh -huh. Don't your kitchen feel lonesome? Uh huh. When your biscuit roll is gone. If you haven't already, please rate and subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. And if you'd like to support the show with a small monthly donation, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash yonder lies that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash yonder lies technical support comes from jackson's community radio station khol 89.1 and the northern rockies conservation cooperative a big thanks to the jackson hole historical society for providing access to hours of archival audio Special shout out to Doug Haberman for our theme music and Becca Hold Houston for our beautiful cover art. <laughs>